A good evening to you all. It's certainly a good evening to be gathered together, and I appreciate the presence of each one here. Appreciate the visitors that we have with us, and we're thankful that you've come to encourage us. We hope we've been an encouragement to you, and we hope you'll come back and be with us anytime that you have the opportunity. I want to thank Tyler so much for his willingness to study the gospel, his willingness to obey Jesus and become a disciple. He's been a great encouragement to me. I've been studying with Tyler and Anna for a little while, and, and uh, his interest in being a disciple of Jesus has been very encouraging, and I thank him so much for his willingness to become a Christian this afternoon. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you will, please. You see up on the screen there what uh, our title is tonight, and I want to thank Andrew for posing for this picture for me. Yeah, <laughs> did a good job doing that. Tonight, let me preface this sermon by saying that we love the law of the Lord. Everyone who assembles here in this place, I hope every one of us can say that we love the Word of God because of what it teaches us. It gives us knowledge of God's will. It gives us knowledge of God's grace. It tells us how to access that grace by faith so that we can have salvation in Jesus Christ. It teaches us everything that we can know about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit. We know nothing more about any of those things if it were not for God's Word. It's precious. It's what guides us into that new life. It's what creates that new man in Christ. And without this, we could never be what we need to be in the eyes of God. About a month ago, maybe more, in one of our Tuesday night question and answer classes, this topic came up. Someone asked the question about, what about lifting up holy hands? And we talked about, Andrew and I, about what the Word of God had to say about that. We had a very good class and a very good discussion about that. Over the last couple of weeks, obviously for some reason, I don't know if this is coincidence or what, this has become a hot topic. Several people over the last couple of weeks have asked me about uh, this particular topic and what, what I think about this, and it's been... Like I said, it's almost been like it's coincidental, like out of the blue. We just talked about this not long ago. And then someone shared a, a Facebook post with me that was very troubling to me. It was very troubling to me because of what it said and the way it was handled. And like I said, I preface this sermon with how we view the Word of God and how important it is to us. And if we make decisions in this life, anything that we do, we want to make sure we're doing what God has revealed to us because we know nothing that will be godly or good or right in the eyes of God unless God has said it, right? I've left the names off of this because the names don't matter. But I wanted to put the post up here so everyone can see it. The first sentence, if you are moved during worship to lift holy hands to God, do so. It's extremely biblical. If you are not so moved, don't. Pretense in worship is the hallmark of the Pharisee. In either case, don't worry about what others will think of you. Also, don't judge others for what they do or don't do. Fear God and worship Him. There's some things about that that I believe are true. The one thing about this that's very upsetting to me is this first line. It's extremely biblical. This sermon is not being preached because we have someone here who does this. We do have someone here who every once in a while raises their hand when singing a song. That particular person, this sermon is not pointed to that person at all. It's not even because of that. That particular person is studying right now consistently. She's growing and learning and doing a very good job of that. She's a very great encouragement to us. And she does something that she's been doing for 80 years of her life, growing up and worshiping in different places. We're not directing this at her at all. But that first line there tells us that something is extremely biblical to do, but it doesn't give us a passage to back that up at all. There's a passage that it's alluded to, and the only passage in the New Testament that says anything about lifting up holy hands is 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. This statement says, if you, the you there means, that means anyone. 
could do this. That is inferred in the statement, you, if you are moved to do this in worship to God, do it. Well, if, it's, if something is extremely biblical, I think we would all agree that we would have a passage in the Word of God to back that up. Biblical things are only found in God's Word. So look at with me, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Paul writes, Therefore I desire that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. We're going to come and examine that passage just here shortly. But don't you just notice something here on the screen. This statement was made, and there were about 600 people who liked or loved that statement. There was 133 people that shared that. That this particular statement was extremely biblical. I want us to talk about that tonight in the hopes that we can reconsider some things if we have questions about this. And I hope it will help us when it comes to our critical thinking and making decisions in light of God's will and reasoning and logical thinking when it comes to God's Word. Because it's extremely important how we do so in making decisions and choosing our practices before Him. What New Testament passage teaches us that all are to raise their hands in worship? Not one. There's not one passage in the New Testament that teaches that. What that first line of that post said, that if you, if you, anyone, wants to raise their hands in worship to God, it's extremely biblical. There's not one New Testament passage that teaches us that. It's not 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8 like we just read. Why is it not 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8? Well, if you'll notice in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8, who is it that's to raise their hands? Holy Spirit says men. I desire that the men do this. Furthermore, when should the men raise their hands? Therefore, I desire that the men, what? They pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands in prayer. So the raising of the hands in this passage is to be done by men when the men are praying. What should the hands be when this is done? It said the hands were to be holy. Holy hands. Furthermore, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8 it isn't a worship-only context. How do I know that? Well, if you go back in verse 8, therefore I desire that the men pray everywhere. This is a practice that was to be done everywhere, not just in the worship assembly. I mean, that, that's what Paul points out. Where should they pray? Pray everywhere. And even more so, if you'll contrast this with verse 9, or at least compare it to verse 9, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. If I'm to take 1 Timothy chapter 2 in just a worship-only context, then women are only supposed to dress modestly in the worship assembly, and they can dress however they want to immodestly anywhere else. Is that how I'm to read 1 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 9? Well, certainly not. We wouldn't read that passage that way. So therefore, we have to conclude that this context is not a worship-only context. It's an everywhere context. The Lord commands the women to dress modestly everywhere. He commands men to pray everywhere. And when they pray, the men are practicing a certain way of praying and lifting up their holy hands to God. As far as another New Testament passage, look over to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. Hebrews chapter 12. We, we certainly can't use Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12 to make this point either. I, I had a preacher one time talk with me, and we were reasoning these things together, and he quoted this passage to me, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 12. He says, I see that verse teaching that. So why don't we read that together? Here we're reading about Christians who are wavering, uh, going back into Judaism. They're going to, or thinking about, some of them already have, leaving the Lord and going back into Judaism because of persecution. And the writer here to the Hebrews is telling them not to quit. You've got to keep on keeping on. You've got to endure. You've been enduring some discipline and some chastening by the Lord. 
And that's not always easy. However, you've got to keep yourself into the fight. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. In regard to who you are right now, in verse 12, he says to them, Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight the paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. What's he talking about in these passages? He's speaking to these individual Christians and saying, what I need you to do is revitalize your spiritual strength. He says, I need to get your, you need to get yourselves refocused and remember who Jesus is and what Jesus has made possible for you. He shed His own blood so that you could be forgiven, so that you can have this wonderful access to this living hope. Don't forget about that. Don't let the world around you and those who are persecuting you push you back into something that's no longer any good. That's what this passage is talking about. Getting their spiritual stamina back into their lives so they can serve the Lord without any fear. So what passage teaches us that all are to raise our hands in worship to God? There's not a passage in the New Testament. Well, secondly, let me do this. Let me just ask the question, just for the the sake of being fair. Can we make an argument from the Old Testament to raise our hands in worship to God? Why don't you turn with me to the Psalms? The Psalms do speak. A lot of places in the, in the Old Testament speak of raising hands to God. Many times, as we've already read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it speaks of lifting hands in prayer. I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm chapter 28. But before we do there, I'm not going to ask you to turn to 1 Kings, but you remember that when Solomon was dedicating the temple, when temple service or Solomon's temple was being dedicated into service, Solomon lifted his hands in prayer to God. Now we could go there and turn there and read that, but that's Solomon lifting his hands in prayer. That practice of praying and lifting of hands. What we are learning is, is that there was this posture of prayer in the Old Testament of lifting the hands when you prayed. There were lots of postures of prayer. Lifting the hands to God was one of those postures. And 1 Kings, those two references teach us that. But in the 28th Psalm, I'd like to go there and read that psalm together, please. Psalm 28, a psalm of David. But let's begin reading in verse 1. To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. Do not be silent to me, lest if you are silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. So we see again there, we've got someone, David, who's praying to God, and David's posture of prayer was lifting his hands to God in doing so. Look at Psalm 141 as well. Psalm 141. Another psalm of David. We'll begin reading here in verse 1 as well. Psalm 141 and verse 1. Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So there again, what we see David, it was was common with him, obviously, is when David prayed to God, he lifted up his hands in prayer to God. I think we're seeing why we have what we have in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. That, that that common posture of prayer that was there in the Old Testament, one of those postures of prayer was carried over into the first century Christian. And it was obviously customary that they were still lifting their hands to God in prayer. Lamentations 2 and verse 19 also speaks of lifting the hands in prayer to God as well. You can take note of that one if you will. But I want to say in the Psalms, Because the Psalms also speak to us of lifting hands and making agreement. Maybe not the Psalms speak of this here, but different Old Testament passages do. And I'll just refer to those and you can take note of them. When Abraham came from his slaughter of the kings in the valley there of the kings, when he met the king of Sodom and the king of Sodom wanted Abraham to take some of the the loot that they had taken from the kings, Abraham said, no, I can't do that because I've raised my hand to God and said, I will not do it. That's just talking about Abraham raising his hand. But he he had made an agreement with the Lord that he wouldn't do that. He wasn't going to take anything 
from them uh, and destroying those kings of the valley there. In Nehemiah chapter 8, when that whole assembly that have returned from captivity are standing there before Ezra, and they're being reminded of what the law says. Ezra has stood up on a pulpit of wood. He's opened the book, and he's read from it from morning until midday. And as Ezra has, has read of the law of Moses, when the people heard that, it said that the people lifted their hands and they said, Amen, Amen. So what we're seeing there is, is there again, these people had lifted their hands and said, Amen, saying they were in agreement with what the law of God had to say. And these people hadn't heard that in a long time. But there again, you have the lifting of the hands there in the Old Testament of, of making an agreement or being in agreement. It also speaks of lifting hands to bless and praise. And also we find this in Leviticus chapter 9. We just studied Leviticus not long ago. And you remember when tabernacle worship was being instated and the, the, the burnt offering was put there on the altar and Aaron turns and he raises his hands and he blesses the people. We see that throughout the Old Testament. But look at Psalm 63, if you will. 63rd Psalm. Psalm 63. Verse 4 is the, the passage that I want to read, but let's just read a few more passages and get the context. Verse 1. O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. This is a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And here again, I think this goes back to what we've all already seen being a practice of David. And I know this is David praising the Lord, but it seems like he's praising the Lord in his name. He's lifting up his words to the Lord. I think here again, this would be better tied back to say that David just lifting up his hands in prayer to God again. But we see this is David doing this in the wilderness of Judah. If you go with me to Psalm 134, we have another one here that, that needs to be noticed and read. Psalm 134. It's a very short psalm, just three verses. Verse 1, Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Who is being charged here? Those who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Who would that have been? Would that not have been the Levites? That would have been the Levites who have been given charge to stand guard at the house of the Lord. There may be some things that they had to do throughout the night there. But what he's saying is, he's saying, you Levites, you men who are, who are being charged to take care of the house of the Lord, to watch over it by night, you lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And there again, I think if we're going to reason this by what we've already read, and we're going to follow the train of thought, it seems to me that this is them again lifting up their hands in prayer and being thankful to God for what God has done for them. If I'm going to let one scripture, as Andrew talked about this morning, explain maybe the vague, we let the obvious explain the vague. So it seems David's practice has been picked up by most men in the Old Testament when they're lifting up their hands and they're praying to God. A posture of prayer. But let's just say that Psalm 140, just, just for the sake of being fair, let's just say Psalm 134 is being done by everyone in the temple. What other Old Testament passage will we use to dictate New Testament worship? Is that something that we do? I like to always remind myself, and I'll remind you too, that when Jesus came to earth and he took on being a human, and he came here and humbled himself to the point that he lived life here among sinful men, 
And he ultimately gave himself so that we could be redeemed because there's no other way that that could happen. That old covenant was in place just to bring about the Messiah into the world. But when the Messiah came, he fulfilled that old covenant. And when he went to the cross and he was nailed to it, he nailed that old covenant to it and took it out of the way. Colossians 2 and verse 14. And we have to remember that. There are some principles that are taught in the Old Testament. They're just as solid of principles then and they are now. Because when God lays down a principle, a principle with God doesn't change because God doesn't change. But there are practices when it came to worship that have changed because God has taken them out of the way and changed them. Principle is one thing, but practice is another thing. Will we go to a passage like Psalm 150 and read Psalm 150? Just begin with me in verse 1. I mean, just, just to get us to consider. Because sometimes we just need to take something and just reconsider it. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise God for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with a timbrel and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with high-sounding cymbals. I mean, can I go to Psalm 150 and say, well, Psalm 150 says this. Can I incorporate that into my New Testament worship today because Psalm 150 says that? We wouldn't argue that because what we know that's been revealed to us in the new covenant is that God wants us when we come together and assemble together to sing to him. We have 10 passages in the New Testament that say sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. And we wouldn't go back to an Old Testament passage in a covenant that's been taken out of the way and replaced with a new covenant and try to insert practices that are no longer in state. We'd never do that. What about Psalm 66? Turn over to Psalm 66 with me. Pick up with me in verse 13. The psalmist writes, I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals. With the sweet aroma of rams, I will offer bulls and goats. What would y'all think if I showed up this evening with my truck and I had a stock trailer hooked to it? And I had a couple of animals banging around back there in the, in the trailer. And I put a rope around a bull and a ram, and I started dragging them in the front door. Are you going to stop me? And he stopped me and said, what are you, Jason, what are you doing? I'm coming to offer my, my bull and my ram. Well, you can't, you can't do that. that well, Psalm 66 says I can. You see, we, don't, we wouldn't reason that way, would we? Why wouldn't we reason that way? Because that practice of offering animal sacrifices has been taken out of the way because we have the all-sufficient once and for all sacrifice of Jesus now. And we wouldn't drop back into a covenant that's no longer in place trying to draw a practice out of that and apply it to New Testament worship today. We wouldn't do that in any way, shape, or form. Because that's not the way God tells us to reason His will. Now, with that in mind, let's turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. You don't have to turn there. You know what it says. I desire the men to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. But let's, let's keep 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8 within its context. The text has to stay in its context. Any text has to stay in its context. What makes the hands holy? Y'all, if, if, if we just started singing here in a little while and I just put my hands up in the air, does that make my hands holy? Do I have to wash them with some special oil or special detergent to make my hands holy? Is that, is that what the passage is teaching us? I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm, just, I'm getting us to try to reason these things. When we read something like that in the text, again, you have a vague text sometimes. Andrew taught us this morning, the best way to identify what's the obscure is to look at what's obvious. We have other passages 
that teach us things in this regard. You're in the psalm still, I hope. Look at verse 24. What we're going to do here is we're not going to drop back to a practice. We're going to drop back to a principle that God spoke through the mouth of David. A principle that's very good. And we'll talk about further why it's very good here in just a second. Psalm 24 and verse 3. David writes, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Who can ascend the holy hill of the Lord? The man who has what? Clean hands and a pure heart. Does that mean that I've, the man's washed his hands really well and they've got all the dirt out from under his fingernails? That can't be what that's talking about, can it? And see, here's a principle that God spoke through David that's a principle that's still sound today. Why is it still sound today? Because you read it again in James chapter 4. Turn with me there, please. James chapter 4. Let's begin reading in verse 7. James 4 in verse 7. James writes, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now that passage explains exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about having clean hands. What do the clean hands have to do with? A life that's not practicing sin. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. If the heart gets purified and we put out those things of the old man who did practice sin, and we fill it up with the Word of God, then what will happen? Then God's going to draw near to us. We can draw near to Him. And what will be is people who are striving to practice righteousness. What we're talking about is whatever makes the kiss holy is the same thing that makes the hands holy. Romans 16 and 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. We've all read that passage. Everyone's heard that passage, haven't you? How many of you came in and greeted one another with a holy kiss tonight? None of us did, but we, we, most of us greeted one another with a holy handshake or the holy hug. But what was the holy kiss here? Well, the holy kiss, the kiss in Rome, was something that was a a, a practice of their greeting. But the emphasis is not placed upon the kiss, but it's placed upon the manner of the greeting. What was it supposed to be? It's to be holy. A holy kiss. It should come from a heart that's pure. Filled with the love of God and love for one another. It shouldn't be an insincere, hypocritical kiss like the kiss that Judas gave Christ when he betrayed him. No, the kiss that the brethren were to give one another or the handshake that I'm to give my brother or my sister and say, I appreciate you and I love you should be one of, with a pure heart of sincerity and truth. It's no different with the hand. When Paul said, when you're practicing this posture of prayer, which some postures were kneeling, some postures were laying down, some postures were flat on their face. But he said, whenever you do practice that posture of prayer, make sure you lift up what kind of hands? Holy hands. The hands exemplify the life of the individual. Last summer, on Friday morning, we were studying 1st and 2nd Samuel together. Some of you remember that. We had a great time, didn't we? And as we were reading through 2 Samuel one day, we got to the 22nd chapter. It took us a while to figure out where it was a while back. But Andrew and I looked at one another when we read that passage, and we both said the same thing. Holy hands. Look what David said here. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanliness of my hands, He has reckoned. When we read that, I think simultaneously we looked at one another and said, holy hands. 
David's not raising his, looking at his hands and saying, look how clean I've gotten my hands. I mean, I got all the blood off of them and from the sacrifice and I've, I've gotten all the dirt off of them. And everything. No. He's saying the life that I'm living before God, I've got it straightened up and straightened out and I'm doing my best to live a godly life before my Lord. And when God looks at me, He sees me striving to practice that type of life. And because I've done that, the Lord has recompensed me. Because I have cleaned up my life. So when you come back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, what can we conclude? Can we not conclude that when we read that passage, that God wants men to offer sincere prayers of the righteous. God said in the first century, when these men were coming with a certain posture of prayer, there was obviously brought over from the Old Testament something that David did. Lots. And something that a lot of men obviously did in the Old Testament. These men were lifting up their hands in prayer. But God says when you do lift up your hands in prayer, make sure you've got clean hands and a pure heart. God doesn't want someone to come to Him in prayer and cry out to them, God, I need you. I need your help. When the life of the individual is being lived in a way where he doesn't recognize God at all. Touch the hands. Now let me say this. Just a second. Let me say this. If someone, if some man, even today, when he stood up and he prayed before this assembly, if he wanted to raise his hands, lift his hands and pray to God, if that man's living a life, his best of his ability, practicing righteousness, and he so wants to lift up his hands and pray to God, does he have a passage for that? He most certainly does. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. But let me say this. If he's doing it here, he better be doing it everywhere. If not, it's not pure. It's for show. Does God desire that? No, He doesn't. Because if, if there's a man that's going to raise his hands and pray in the assembly, lifting his hands, he ought to be a man sitting at his kitchen table praying with his family or by himself, lifting his hands, because that's his practice. But God said, do it everywhere. If that be the posture you want to take in prayer, some people take the posture of kneeling every time they pray. Does that mean I can bind that posture on someone else? Can I bind the posture of kneeling on you? Can I bind the posture of lifting holy hands in prayer on you? No, I can't. When we really get down to the heart of the matter, what God wants is man coming to Him in prayer reverently, offering up the prayers of the righteous. I hope you understand why this has been so concerning. Because it all comes back to us being critical thinkers when it comes to the Word of God. There are times that there are people who come to us and they come from different places and different circumstances in life and there's things that they practice for many, many years. And it takes a while to study through those things. And we're going to be patient about that. But when it comes to rightly discerning the Word of God, this isn't how to do it. 600 people agreed with the practice of lifting up holy hands in any area of worship by anyone saying it was extremely biblical. And tonight what we've done is we've opened up God's Word and we've saw that it's not extremely biblical because God never did say it was. It would be like me getting up here and telling you all, that you know what, it's okay for us to have cornbread and apple juice on the Lord's table. And not giving you a passage for it and just walking away. Someone may overhear that on the live stream and say, well, you know, that sounds like, that sounds like something that came from the Bible. It talked about bread and it talked about uh, juice. So I believe we could do that. In the same way here, someone could post something like this and it has an a inference to a passage that talks about holy hands. But the passage that talks about lifting up holy hands is a passage that talks about men lifting up holy hands in prayer everywhere. Not everyone. 
And when you tie that passage into something that takes it to a broad place, including everyone in it, then you've taken a text out of its context, and then it's become nothing but a pretext. And that's not good either. And all I'm trying to do is remind us of how important it is to read the Word of God take the text within its context, and then decide what God desires for us to do. Because remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If any man speaks, he'll speak as the oracles or the words of God. This is extremely important because so many people, obviously, so many people can read something like this with no scriptural reference at all whatsoever and be compelled to do exactly what it says. Just think about it. There may be someone today that read this a week or so ago and went to worship this morning and decided that he'd do just that. While he was singing, he raised his hands up like that. And three more people looked over there at him, and they examined that, and they did that too. But let me ask you, why did those people do that? One person did it because he read a Facebook post that had no scriptural precedent whatsoever and he thought it was extremely biblical and it was. And two or three other people did that just because they saw someone else do it and thought it was good. Y'all see my problem? The the issue we can have with that. And almost 600 people and whoever posted this and whoever shared this, I do not hate these people and I'm not trying to condemn these people whatsoever. I love these people with all my heart. And I have really nothing to do with what other churches may do, what other Christians may do, unless they come and they ask me to teach on something. But I am primarily concerned about the Gardendale Church and what the Gardendale Church does and how we may be influenced to do something that we have no biblical precedent for. And if we start reasoning things this way, what's next? What will we reason next time we have no biblical precedent for because we've allowed someone to compel us to do something otherwise? Critical thinking is important when it comes to the Scriptures. Critical thinking is important in our service to God because in our service to God and the way we do so according to His will is what honors and glorifies Him and allows us to continue to have fellowship with Him through the Apostles' message. That's how important it is. Our eternity hangs in the balance. I'll be glad to further talk with you about this more if you so desire. But I want to thank you for your good attention tonight and I appreciate you listening so well. Tonight, we want to extend the Lord's invitation to those who may be here and may not yet have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you may understand that you need to do that. And if you do understand that, like we have already seen tonight, how important it is and how there's a sense of urgency that goes along with that, please do so. Please have your sins washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. There's nothing better than that. Make sure that heaven's going to be your home and let nothing in this world stop you. We stand ready to help you. No matter what that may be, we'll stand ready to help you. If you need to make your life right with God tonight, no matter what circumstance it may be, we stand ready to help you in any way that we possibly can. Won't you please come while we stand and we sing this song?